Okay, so that's just a little bit of color, a little bit of background as to the traditional financial system, right? We still live in this world, still runs most of the modern world, um, but maybe that's starting to change with the idea of digital cash. So I'll hand this one out in a moment. Um, but for now, we're just looking at some ideas here that have contributed to digital cash and showing that the ideas go back to the 1980s where people, so remember databases got really good in the 1970s. Computers were started, developed in the 50s and 60s, 1970s databases. 1980s, we started to get like um, cheaper computing, networked computing, you know, not necessarily internet, but networked computing. Um, and people were starting to do mathematics that previously it didn't seem possible in the computer. So that includes things like cryptography. So one of the fathers here of digital cash is a cryptographer named David Chom. And he started early with this idea of how can we make money such that it's in a digital form and still works like money that we're used to today. So I said here, does it sound hard? I mean, it sounds, I guess on first approach, you think, yeah, why do, you know, do, why do we not have money that works like our traditional finance system? Um, so one thing that leads into this, uh, that contributes to this is the digital abundance in this case, it's a problem. And another thing particularly relevant to blockchains is the double spend problem. So some attempts that we've seen before are DigiCash in 1989. So we have offline eCash. We have B-Money in 98. David Chaum here, he kind of made a real thing, um, but it wasn't necessarily decentralized. B money is more of a thought experiment or an essay. It wasn't actually built. And then another one that comes up a lot is bit gold, which sort of starts to sound now like Bitcoin, meaning that gold is a good store of value, well known throughout history. Uh, so bit gold and Bitcoin. Uh, this guy, Nick Szabo, is sometimes thought to perhaps be or have some close ties to the pseudonymous creator of Bitcoin. Uh, the anonymous creator of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto. Okay, so digital cash, why is it so hard? So the double spend problem is related to this idea of counterfeiting. So double spending, it's, it's as it sounds. Like, can you spend a $50 note and then spend it again? And it's like, well, if it's cash, you have to give that note to someone else and then it's theirs. So you can't go take it from them and spend it again. So if you were to try to double spend physical banknotes, you could try to counterfeit them. Um, and you know, it's, this, is, this is well known by the banks that perhaps people might try to counterfeit money, print their own money. Uh, and so the way around this is to create some security features and put it into your notes. And you know, nowadays there's like holograms on them and they're like made of mylar and they're like, they're transparent bits and micro printing and all sorts of weird things. Uh, the Americans, they put like a, they, they like embed like a strip into their notes. Um, so they make it so that it's very hard to copy. Physically, it's difficult to copy. And so I say it's related to double spending, um, this idea of counterfeiting, which could let you spend money that really um, you didn't earn in like a zero sum game. The digital portion is related to this idea that it's really easy to copy and paste stuff. So digital abundance, just an idea of the digital trajectory here. Uh, in 2009, it was, you know, 11 and a half cents for a gigabyte of storage. So you go out and you buy a USB stick or you get your new phone. That's about what you're paying for storage. Uh, nowadays, it is one and a half cents. So that's a whole order of magnitude in 14 years. The storage has, so this is like an exponential decay in the cost of storage, and that is indicative of how easy it is to copy and paste data online or to create data and store it um, in, a, in a persistent fashion. And like this chart's gonna keep going, right? If we were to zoom in for the next 14 years, we'll probably see the same thing, where storage per gigabyte will go down another order of magnitude. So if you're making digital money, make a digital, 
note, let's say it's a digital note, you put like some Adobe PDF protections on it, some digital rights management, you're like, yeah, it's copyrighted, you can't edit it, right? But the problem is that it's so easy to copy everything that's online. And this has kind of like been an, uh, an ongoing problem for people that create valuable things, right? Your music, your art, your, your movies, right? Sony Studios gets hacked and their video gets leaked. Uh, uh, you know, big issue, big issue for them. You can imagine how tricky it would be if someone tried to create digital money and it was fallible in this way that you could copy it. Right, so how do banks prevent you from double spending themselves? So in terms of the notes we talked about, it's kind of related, it's very hard to counterfeit a note, but what about the banks? Most of our money is online in a bank account. Uh, you know, surely with some tech savvy skills, we should be able to manipulate this. So banks, they do a few things. The first thing they do is they take their profits and they invest it in their buildings. So they have the biggest building in town uh, and it's very nice when you walk inside uh, this is, this view is maybe getting a bit outdated, but you know banks are always on the uh, on the main corner and the main street in the city, and they're the tallest building to really show you that they have this presence. And what they're doing there is they're telling everyone that they can be trusted. So the trust is how banks in their centralized manner do it. Uh, the other thing they do is buy physical by physically storing the valuable things inside of a vault uh, and uh, centralizing this process. You, of course, could store your own wealth in a vault, but it might be expensive and difficult to build your own vault. And you know, banks are very good at this. It's actually pretty cheap to use a bank, right? They'll, they'll probably let you in for no fees or like less than $50 or something. Happy to sign you up and get you in the door. And they're very good at keeping your money. It's very rare that your money gets stolen from a bank. Uh, there might even be insurance in case there is a physical breach and someone steals money from, from the bank. Right? So, so in this sense, banks are good, lots of trust. Uh, physically, they're very impressive. But they're not digital, are, are they? Right? So what do we do if we want it to be digital and decentralized? Um, so again, the banks are all centralized. All the profits flow up the org chart to the top. Um, you know, whether it's China Construction Bank or uh, uh, RBS, Royal Bank of Scotland, or HSBC, right? Whatever the biggest bank of the moment is, all those profits flow up, and it's very centralized. So we're trying here to take money, remove the bank, or remove that middleman, that middlewoman, take her out so that we can all share in the splendor, okay? So to get this idea of a distributed, decentralized system, we've got a poker analogy. Uh, so you may have seen or played poker. Hopefully you've ever maybe, maybe not played poker. Um, game of cards, right, between friends, and you're gonna exchange money, and you know at the end, someone's gonna walk away with all of it. So if we are playing poker among friends, one way to do it is with poker chips, or with coins, or with cash. You have a stack, and you split it up depending on how the cards fall. Now, if you don't have chips, what you need to do is you need to write down who has what. It's kind of like a schoolyard game, right? Kids can play poker. You just got to keep track of who's winning the hand and who has all the chips. And then when you don't have any more chips, you got to say, like, sorry, Jeff, you're out of the game. Like you. It's written down right here. You don't have any more chips. You don't have any more credits in order to play. So just like keeping track of the score in a game, this is a ledger, OK? The way that it works between players at the table is you can see everyone. I could see everyone here. And if it's a small enough table, right, you can physically see if someone's trying to subvert the system and take off with chips. In a really big game, you need some sort of ledger system where everyone's writing down what everyone else has. And that's why all these ledgers are the same. You don't just want to keep track of your score, but the whole tables. So this is a distributed system where we don't have like cash that's produced by a central bank. Okay, so we've got a distributed system. 
How do we prevent double spending in a digital manner? So again, double spending is being able to copy and paste, send your money to Amazon, and send your money to TradeMe. Hurrah, I can do it twice. Right, well, it's, it's kind of simple once you know it. We just need heaps of digital ledgers. Rather than everyone writing it down, we're going to do it digitally. And then everyone's going to store their own copy while agreeing that you all have the same copy as me. Just like a really big global poker game, as long as I keep track of the ledger, I can trust that my chips are what it says because my, uh, my stack is represented on everyone else's ledger as well. So heaps of ledgers. Now this is slightly different. We got giant ledgers here, giant scrolls, um, because you have to store all of the data. In this case, you have to store the entire history. Easy for a poker game, you can do it on one sheet or a card game or something like that, right? But what about for you know, 15 years of transaction history between hundreds of thousands of people? The, the ledger can get quite large. And we'll talk about some of this as we go through, this idea of being able to scale the system while still storing the entire history. Here I'll just go through a few of the bits and pieces of tech that come together to make uh, Bitcoin in this case, or you know, all other blockchains are copies and derived from Bitcoin. Uh, so th the first one we'll look at here, just in brief, is this idea of time stamping or secure time stamping as a data structure to preserve history. So what we're looking at here is just a linked list where the arrows, the horizontal arrows are links to the next element. These angled arrows are hashes going into uh, the digital object. We'll talk about hashes next week. And the documents here are something that you want to have marked in history. As a real example here, we have someone publishing a timestamp in a newspaper. So you see this sometimes if you want to validate your account online where you need to get like a, like a, take a selfie and you might have to include a newspaper. Um, certainly for some of the older crypto exchanges, you had to do this. I think maybe once upon a time on Reddit, you had to do this as well. Um, and so we kind of know what a newspaper represents and what it can do. But now we have, you know, this doesn't mean anything to me, but if you were the owner of that document, then maybe legally you need to prove that in July 2009, um, it was there. And so this idea of linked timestamping has been around for quite a while. And the linking here can be like the chain in our blockchain. And the timestamping can be accomplished in a similar fashion. There's going to be a specific way that we go about doing this. But linked timestamping just creates an absolute ordering of events, which is kind of what the bank does in the centralized manner, right? You want to make sure that you want to make sure that my salary goes into the bank account before it goes and I uh, settle all my debts, right? I don't want to send money out before it comes in. So that needs to be ordered somehow in the ledger. Fairly straightforward in a centralized way to do this. Less straightforward when you have everybody each having their own copy of the ledger. It's less obvious how you can have this ordering of events. And then by using something like a hash function, which is the H in the diagram, okay, we can make it very light. And again, we'll talk about this next week, but we don't have to store the whole document itself. We'll just take a hash. It's very light. It's very short. It's very small, easier to store. So link timestamping gets us our chain. Proof of work is kind of a, a uniquely Bitcoin, well, now it's a uniquely Bitcoin thing. It's a uniquely blockchain thing as well. Although it does have some early roots. So we'll take a detour here and talk about uh, email spam. So the original simple mail transfer protocol, SMTP, had and still has no facility to authenticate senders, meaning that you could fake 
who you are sending the email from. Okay, and so this is how you get caught in an email scam. You look at it, you're like, oh, it looks legit, right? It's from customer service at anz.co.nz. You're like, oh, must be from my bank, right? Um, and so spoofing email, it's been around a long time, and so people have been thinking about how can we reduce this? How can we eliminate this email, email spam? So this comes back, uh, this uses the idea of, so there's a academic paper, pricing via processing. And then Adam Back, <clears throat> who's a well-known contributor to Bitcoin, uh, he also wrote a paper called Hashcash. And so this is used in what's now called proof of work in Bitcoin. The idea is that you have to prove your computer did some work, the processor took some time to do some work before you're allowed uh, you know, to send your email. So from a spammer's point of view, you might be sending 10,000 emails a day. If your computer had to pause five seconds and do a calculation, every time it sent an email, right, spamming would be less profitable because it would take you hours and hours and hours to send that message. If you're an individual and you're only sending five or 10 or 20 emails, that's fine. It happens in the background, five seconds, no bother. My computer does the work and then sends the email. So it's fine on an individual basis, but as it scales up, it's very expensive. So this is this idea. Same thing with uh, Bitcoin. You don't want, in a decentralized network, you don't want it to be able to be scaled up too quickly because that would imply that it's no longer a fair game. Some large actor could come in with a big paycheck or um, a lot of resources and could scale up the system and spam it really quickly. So you want to enable some sort of um, level playing field. And that's the idea of proof of work which we will spend a bit of time talking about on its own. So if we take some of these tech pieces and start to put them together, we get an idea of where the digital cash, we get an idea of how digital cash could be created. We'll come back to this idea of money for a, for a minute. Uh, in 2006 to 2008, there was this problem with the housing market predominantly in America, but then it also spilled over into Europe, where uh, there were too many loans and there were not enough houses and there was not enough income to pay for all the loans uh, in the houses. So th this is called the global financial crisis nowadays, or the housing crisis. Sort of the climax here was when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt September 15th, 2008. I only have the date because it's important relative to when Satoshi the anonymous creator of Bitcoin published um, the white paper to a cryptography mailing list. So on Halloween 2008, just a little bit after Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, Satoshi said, all right, uh, he had been working on it prior to this, but he posted um, this idea of Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. And so this is the first mention that we have of it which, you know, looking back is very important, but looking forward, there's like hundreds of thousands of mentions of new ideas every day on the internet that, you know, few people pay attention to or, or the ideas don't get taken up and don't end up doing anything going anywhere. But this is one that, that did. A couple months later, the first Bitcoin block was produced, and so everybody that participates in the network, has a copy of this, and can go validate it, and can go look at it. And there was a message posted in that very first block, now called the Genesis block. And so this is the hex printout of the block. So this is hexadecimal data. Um, and then there is a message here. And the message relates to a newspaper, right? That's our digital timestamp showing that this block was produced on or after the date of the headline of this newspaper. And of course, uh, perhaps Satoshi was waiting for a good headline. Who really, we don't, we don't really know. Perhaps it just happened that uh, it's finance related, right? Chancellor of the Exchequer in the United Kingdom is on the brink of a second bailout for banks. Right, a bailout for banks being that they're just going to um, forgive the debts so that the bank doesn't go into bankruptcy and it keeps 
providing banking services for, pe for people. And then what we'll do is we'll nationalize those losses. And rather than having to get the bank to pay back that money over 10 or 20 or 30 years, right, we're just going to take it out of the national fund, which, you know, is everybody's money. And so there was a lot of this going on in America and Europe. And uh, Satoshi was like, let's see what we can do about it. So, you know, now, 14 years on, this is like very, very famous stuff. And if you like Google any of this stuff, there's lots and lots of information about it. Again, in hindsight. Now, coming out of COVID, right, we've seen another round of this idea that uh, businesses are not allowed to fail. And how are we going to pay for them? Well, we'll just nationalize all of the losses and we'll make everybody pay for them. And so we're, we're still going through this you know, in terms of lessons learned. So linked timestamping, going to linked ledgers. This is now sort of, this is what a blockchain looks like. So I've drawn some books, kind of like the Medici ledgers, right? When you finish a book, you like date it, add everything up, put it on the shelf, and then you get a blank book to start the next in line. So in the first block, we're going to fill it up with data. And then when that block is full, or after a set amount of time, we start a new book. And then we want to link the new book to the old book. So you know this is just like a, a hash pointer in data structures, or it's a date and a number in your ledgers. Or in this case, what we're going to do is we're just going to have a hash pointer. So we're going to take a hash, and we're going to say the previous block is this one, or the previous book is the one right before it. And again, a hash is nice and light. It's easy to do. You don't have to make that copy all on your own. Like You don't have to copy it bit by bit. Uh, time goes to the right, and we get a new block. Um, in Bitcoin, this happens every 10 minutes. We'll spend lots of time talking about um, this block interval and what it means and what we can do about it. Is it too long? Is it too short? Well, this is the current ledger here, ID3. There is another one being mined presently. So in the works right now, even though we don't see it, someone is out there working on the very next block to put on the chain. And so a linked ledger is one way to put it. A blockchain is another way to put it. Sometimes you hear DLT, Distributed Ledger Technology. It's kind of a mouthful. I think just use the word blockchain. It's fine. Uh, it's it's descriptive, right? It's a chain of blocks. So this is what a Bitcoin, what a Bitcoin, this is what a blockchain looks like. Um, what about these blocks though? So we'll, we'll just dig into these blocks and then we'll wrap. So in the block itself, right? It's a digital data structure. So here's what we've, here's what we've got. Take a look. Okay, so that link took me to blockchain. This is a block explorer. And we can see here, these are all a bunch of different blockchains that block chair is going to let us explore. And we want Bitcoin. Okay, so there's a lot of info on this page. This block we're looking at is number 832,000. The first block we just saw the timestamp and the message for Chancellor on the brink. So that started in 2009. Of course, Bitcoin is still running. Um, 832,000 blocks later. And so there's a lot of info on a page like this. And we will, not in heaps of detail, but by the time we're done here, we'll be able to decode all of this information. Um, size, how many nodes, latest block was 16 minutes ago, uh, difficulty level, next estimated difficulty level, and the change from the current one. That happens a week from now. Um, mempool, this is where the transactions are gathered. How many fees in the last block? Half a million dollars in fees. So you might think, oh, this could be good business here to be a miner and process transactions. Uh, let's look at some transactions then. 
So transactions are labeled by their hash. One input, one output, let's, maybe there's a bit more interesting one. Let's look at this one. So some information here, how much was transacted, what was the fee, some information about BTC and also Satoshis, 16 Satoshis, and who sent it and where did it go? Okay, so senders are identified here by this address. All right, and you can imagine now that this maps to a, perhaps a real person. Uh, or some entity, right? Um, and we didn't have to gain permission to look on the Explorer to find out that information, right? All public information, so that's another important facet um, of this. Okay, I could click around there for a while, but you can also click around there on your own. Um, in terms of just being able to package the information, it's pretty straightforward. Our transactions here are just a list. We have some other information there, like a Merkle root. Um, we have a nonce. Anything else interesting? Previous block hash, um, which allows us to link back to the previous block. So uh, things like this. So when you think about what a block in a blockchain is, right? It's just a bunch of data that's been packaged up, hopefully in a way that makes sense in order to store information. Now, in the terms of Bitcoin, that information is probably money. That's what Bitcoin was designed to do, send value back and forth. And so that's what it's really good at, just tracking balances of Bitcoins. Other blockchains do other things, and they might be really good at doing those other things, but they're likely just transacting data. So a few characteristics and quirks, which again, we'll come back to, but you know, why, why, is, why is Bitcoin, I mean, it's a big question, why is Bitcoin essentially um, the predominant blockchain that we have, and what are some of the characteristics? So the first one is it has a fixed supply. So this is quite unique in terms of money, so the creators of Bitcoin, or Satoshi just himself, uh, decided that there would be an upper limit of 21 million Bitcoins, and uh, you know, that should be enough. You know? um, keeping in mind that a Bitcoin is divisible down to eight decimal places, so you can divide it up quite a bit. I think we just saw there a fee in that block was like $1.88, but the number of Satoshis the, was like, the number of Bitcoin was like 0 0.000014, something like that, right? So it can be divided up much smaller than dollars and cents. Now the fixed supply also leads back to the study of money and monetary policy and finance, right? What does it mean to have a cap on the money supply? And well, it, it means that, you know, Chris Luxon or Chris Hipkins or Jacinda Ardern, right? Whoever's in charge, it means that they cannot print any more money because there's a cap, there's an upper limit, right? It's kind of like having a, you know, if you're, if you're a family, you have to balance your books at home. You can't spend more than the money that's coming in, right? Or you go into debt, right? And then debt collections, you know, serious business, right? On a bigger level, councils also aren't allowed to go into debt. They have to balance their books, right? But what is the federal government, what is the main government allowed to go in, into debt? And, and then to get out of debt, they just change the upper limit of the money that's available. So, you know, it's, it's all tied together. Uh, Bitcoin has this thing called a block reward, meaning that if you contribute to the chain and you add information to the system, you're rewarded for your effort. Okay. Um, back to our centralized example of banks, the way that they reward people for their effort is through a salary. So if you work for the bank, you earn a salary and you do some work for them, right? And that's, that's enough to keep you going. Uh, the way that a blockchain works, especially a decentralized one, is that there's no salary payments going out. So we need to incentivize people to contribute to the system. And the main incentive is from the block reward. 
The other incentive is from the fees that people are paying in order to use the system. And hopefully that can be distributed in a way that everyone agrees with, you know, rather than all of the value accumulating at a few entities or individuals. The difficulty adjustment, we'll talk about this, quite a, uh, quite a brilliant incorporation here by Satoshi, which Which prevents, um, which prevents this exponential. We saw the, the value of the boulevard. Um, we saw the decay on the log scale of the value of the boulevard. So this kind of prevents this idea by the difficulty adjustment where a large entity with a lot of money could come in and just make all the Bitcoins for themselves. So this kind of keeps the playing field a bit more level, although we'll see that it hasn't necessarily worked out that way. Something called a longest chain fork choice rule. We'll talk about this. You know, and again, I guess one of the conclusions here is that incorporating money in tech is a socio-technical system, right? Society and technology, meaning that we don't always know how it's going to work out, right? You kind of like release the software into the wild and you're like, let's see what people do with it. And there might be unintended consequences. Uh, so the social factor, not to be underrated at all, very, very important, right? What, you know, look at what, look at how people spend their time, look at what people spend their money on, and you'll be able to see what's important to them, right? Uh, so it's a socio-technical system. Uh, and maybe I should put here, it's a slash, it's an experiment. Uh, it's only been alive for 14 years, but it seems to be thriving, and it seems to be working well for what it's designed to do. And certainly that's what I'm here for. And I plan on staying around a long time studying and hopefully teaching this stuff. All right, so summary for today, our intro to Bitcoin and money. You know, all the pieces to solve digital cash had already been available, but Satoshi kind of put them together in a unique way that hadn't been seen before. You could say the unique contribution was this idea of securing the network via proof of work. So proof of work is use your computer, use your silicon to do some work that can't be easily copied. You have to actually do the work. Uh, I say yourself, but like you have to arrange for those computers to do the work. Get everyone to participate, and that's going to keep the network secure, because if anybody else comes in, they have to play by those same rules. And this idea of, of doing it, so we've got proof of work to both mint money via the block reward. So if you contribute to the network, you could earn some money if you um, produce the next block. And that's where the minting function comes from, right? But also that's where the distributed network comes from, this idea that everybody has a copy of the ledger. And so we're kind of hitting a couple of different problems here at the same time, and it prevented double spending in the context of digital money. So if I try to double spend my coins, I can create a transaction that does that on my own PC, on my own computer. I can send it out to the network, but the rest of the network is going to reject it. They're not going to accept that Jeff tried to spend his coins twice. Um, they're going to validate every transaction I say they, meaning every single other participant does this. You know, it's not people doing this, right? It's their, it's their nodes that they're running. Uh, and so I can try to double spend. Certainly, you're allowed to try to subvert the rules. <clears throat> you're allowed to try to copy Bitcoins. You're allowed to try to guess private keys <clears throat> uh, and do all of this, right? But if the network doesn't agree to it, if everyone else says, like, oh, Jeff, you're out to lunch, like, we're not going to accept accept that block, we're not going to accept that transaction, uh, then it's not going to work. So this solved double spending in the context of a digital currency, and we have since seen a lot of iterations, a lot of people copying the idea and trying out different designs, trying out different incentives, and we'll talk about some of these. And we will talk about some of these as we go. Okay, some readings. So Satoshi's paper, it's, there's not much to it. It's only nine pages. So I expect you can breeze through it pretty quick. Um, 
and you can dig into more concepts from there if you are interested in them. We will be covering a lot of them as we go. Some image credits. Okay, so that ends the PowerPoint. So what should we do now? Should we take any questions? Or comments?